Okay, so I think that that's that's good. So everybody's fine with it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I haven't paid the fee, so I couldn't log in. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, um, chalo, theek hai. Okay, 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 okay. All right, so let's start. Now, uh, the next thing that we have to do, we finished with clearance. Yes, uh, we finished with clearance, and um, let's see the next thing. And next, I'm going to discuss with you. How does the um, kidney handle? Now let's see renal handling of different substances. But, but before I, uh, before that, um, before we go on to renal handling of sodium, potassium, how does the kidney handle different substances? One thing that you have to understand is how to calculate the filtrations uh, filtration rate of a substance. How do you calculate the filtration rate? Now, what is filtration rate? Again, please remember when we use the term rate, it means per unit time, per unit time. So let us see what is filtration rate. Now, this is the Bowman's capsule here. Here is the afferent arteriole, glomerular capillaries, efferent arteriole and uh, peritubular capillaries, peritubular capillaries, right? Now, this is, uh, so I want to know, what is the rate of rate of filtration of a substance? How do I calculate the filtration rate of a substance? What is filtration rate? Filtration rate of a substance will be GFR. What is filtration rate? This is going to be GFR into plasma concentration of that substance. That is going to be the filtration rate, right? GFR into the plasma concentration of the uh, plasma concentration of substance. Yes, uh, GFR, you know, is in ml per minute. Plasma concentration, you will take it in milligram per ml. ml and ml will get cancelled and this will be mil milligrams per minute. Again, please keep in mind, how do you calculation of, calculate the filtration rate, GFR into plasma concentration? And the moment you say rate, it has to be per unit time. And I've told you, this is going to be milligram per ml, right? Milligram, uh, sorry, milligram per minute, per unit time, okay? All right. So this is as far as your filtration rate is concerned. Now, um, how do you calculate? The second is, how do you calculate the excretion rate? How do you calculate the excretion rate? That means what is the uh, rate of um, how uh, what is the rate at which a substance is eliminated in the urine? And that is urinary concentration into the rate of urine flow. Urinary concentration into rate of urine flow. That is going to be the excretion rate. Again, urinary concentration is milligram per ml. Rate of urine flow is ml per minute and ml and ml get, get cancelled, this is also going to be a milligram per minute. So this is the filtration rate and the um, excretion rate. Yes, this is also known as the filtered load. Absolutely the same thing. This is filtered. It can also be called the filtered load. Filtered load or filtration rate would mean same thing. GFR into plasma concentration of that substance. How do you calculate the excretion rate? Urinary concentration of that substance into the rate of urine flow. And both are rates, so both are going to be per unit time. Right? Okay, now let us see. Um, uh, let us see how does the kidney, uh, before I take on the handling of individual substances by the kidney, let's see a little bit about the tubular functions. Tubular functions. This is going to be tubular functions is uh, just this is more of a general thing. So don't uh, get too perturbed. We'll be doing it in detail a little later. Right. So this is tubular functions. Let's see this. I'm going to draw the nephron here. Loop of Henle, descending thin segment, ascending thin limb. This descending uh, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Okay, collecting duct. So this is this is what the nephron looks like. Right now, we've already discussed what is GFR. How much is the GFR? GFR is one twenty-five ml 
per minute or you can also write it as 180 liters per day, right? GFR is 125 ml per minute or 180 liters per day. Now, the filtrate which is produced is isotonic with plasma. Please understand, the osmolality of the glomerular filtrate is the same as that of plasma. In terms of amount, in terms of percentage, it is 20% of the plasma flow, the GFR. But the composition of the filtrate is same as the composition of the plasma. There is a distinction between these two things. I told you earlier, filtration fraction is 20%. That means out of the entire plasma which flows into the kidney, 20% is filtered to form the glomerular filtrate. But this filtrate is going to be isotonic with plasma. Right? This is isotonic with plasma. How is it kind of, how is it isotonic with plasma? It has the same composition as plasma because this is filtrate is nothing but plasma minus the plasma proteins. And we already know proteins contribute only two milliosmoles to osmolality. Right? Now, as it passes through the PCT, as it passes through the PCT, uh, glucose and amino acids. Glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed to the extent of glucose and amino acids. These are absorbed to the extent of 100% in the PCT. Bicarbonate is also absorbed in the PCT and more than 80% of the filtered bicarbonate will be reabsorbed in the PCT. Urea. Urea is reabsorbed to the extent of 52% in the PCT. 52% in the PCT. Solutes, electrolytes, electrolytes such as sodium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, these are, these are reabsorbed to the extent of 60% in the PCT. Water is reabsorbed to the extent of 66% in the PCT. Right? So basically what is happening in the PCT is PCT, the amount of solute and water absorption is nearly the same. Solute and water absorption is the same. So what will happen to fluid at the end of PCT? At the end of PCT, the tubular fluid continues to remain isotonic with plasma. Same osmolality as plasma. Why so? Because whatever the amount of solutes and the amount of water being absorbed in the PCT is the same. So the fluid continues to remain isotonic in the plasma. Now, as it passes through the descending thin segment, there is reabsorption of water and fluid at the tip of loop of Henle will be hypertonic. Fluid at the tip of loop of Henle will be hypertonic. What is absorbed in the thick ascending limb? What is absorbed in the thick ascending limb is solute, sodium potassium chloride, right? Na plus, K plus and Cl minus. Yes, these are absorbed in the Na plus, K plus and Cl minus. These are absorbed in the thick ascending limb. But please remember, the absorption of solutes in the thick ascending limb is more than the absorption of water, right? more than the absorption of water. So what will happen to fluid at the tubular fluid at the end of loop of Henle? This will now become hypotonic. Why hypotonic? Because the absorption of solutes in the thick ascending limb is more than the absorption of water. I've depicted this by making thicker arrows showing you absorption of electrolytes Absorption of sodium potassium chloride is much more than the absorption of water in the descending limb. So fluid at the end of loop of Henle will become hypotonic, dilute. And in fact, this thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, this thick ascending limb, in fact, this, this limb, the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, this is known as the diluting segment of the nephron. This is known as the diluting segment of the nephron. Why diluting segment? It is producing a dilution of the tubular fluid. How is it producing a dilution of the tubular fluid? By absorbing more solutes as compared to absorption of water. And this is sometimes also known as the medullary diluting segment because this lies in the medulla. This lies in the medulla. Have you understood? So what has happened is 
The glomerular filtrate was isotonic. This is not 150, it is isotonic. Isotonic with respect to plasma. Fluid at the end of PCT continues to remain isotonic. Why? Because these solutes and water are absorbed to the same extent. Jitna solute, utna water. So fluid continues to remain isotonic. In the, at the tip of loop of Henle, fluid, tubular fluid becomes hypertonic. Why? Because there is absorption of water in the descending thin segment. In the thick ascending limb, there is going to be absorption of solutes, but the absorption of solutes in the thick ascending limb is more than the absorption of water. So that tubular fluid at the end of loop of Henle is hypotonic. The thick ascending limb is known as the dilute medullary diluting segment. And this was asked as a neat question as recently as 2018, right? This is medullary diluting segment. In the DCT, in the DCT, there is going to be more absorption of solutes, solutes as compared to water. No absorption of water, only absorption of solutes in the DCT. So in fact, the DCT, the DCT is also known as the cortical diluting segment. Why cortical? Because DCT lies in the cortex. This is known as the cortical diluting segment. There are two diluting segments, a medullary diluting segment, which is the thick ascending limb, and DCT is known as the cortical diluting segment. But if you ever get a question, and this is the question which was asked in the NEET exam, which is the diluting segment? Your better answer is thick ascending limb. Why thick ascending limb is the most important diluting segment? Because here the reabsorption of the uh, sodium potassium chloride um, is more than, much more than what happens in the DCT. So this is, if only diluting segment, thick ascending limb. Medullary diluting segment, thick ascending limb. Cortical diluting segment, uh, DCT. Okay. See, why is it known as the medullary diluting segment also has an important uh, reason and the reason is if you look at the kidney the kidney has an outer cortex and an inner medulla right it has an outer cortex and an inner medulla and if you look at the two types of nephrons which are present in the kidney you've got cortical nephrons this is a cortical nephron and in a cortical nephron the loop of henley is also present in the no, loop of Henle, these are 85% of the total and loop of Henle is also present in the cortex. Then the second one that you have is what is known as the juxtamedullary nephron. This juxtamedullary nephron, the juxtamedullary nephron, these are just 15% of the total. The glomerulus lies in the, uh, in the cortex, but the loop of Henle lies in the medulla. And this loop of Henle has got thin and thick limbs. This has the descending thin segment. It has the uh, ascending thin segment. It has the thick ascending limb. This is in the juxtamedullary. Remember, it is the juxtamedullary nephrons which are responsible for concentration of urine. They are responsible for producing a concentrated urine. Right? So a cortical nephron does not have thin and th thick segments. Have you understood? No thick cortical nephrons does not have, it does not have no thin or thick segments. The loop of Henle of a cortical nephron has uniform diameter. Thin and thick segments are present in the juxtamedullary nephron. So thick ascending limb will be present only in the medulla, not in the cortex. So thick ascending limb is also known as the medullary diluting segment. Have you understood it, right? It is sometimes only called the diluting segment or a medullary diluting segment, okay? DCT also known as the cortical diluting segment. If you look at the collecting duct, now collecting duct is what is known as the hormone regulated segment. Collecting is the hormone regulated segment. Why is known as the 
hormone regulated segment because there are two important hormones which act over here. Two important hormones which act over here. Number one is ADH. ADH will act on the collecting duct which increases the water reabsorption. In the collecting duct, it increases the water reabsorption, right? Then you also have aldosterone. Aldosterone on the collecting duct. Aldosterone on the collecting duct. It increases sodium reabsorption. It increases potassium secretion. And it also increases the H plus secretion. Okay. Sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, H plus secretion, aldosterone. Another hormone which acts over here is ANP. ANP will decrease the sodium reabsorption in the collecting duct. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay. DTS is descending thin segment, right? DTS is descending thin segment. ATS is ascending thin segment. TAL is thick ascending limb. Okay? Right? This is thick ascending limb. This is ascending thin segment. And this is descending thin segment. Right? These are standard nomenclature. Thick limb is only ascending. Thin limb is descending and ascending. Have you understood? Right? Now, the collecting duct is known as the hormone regulated segment because there are three, at least two major hormones which act over here ADH and aldosterone, and they will determine the final composition of urine. ADH will increase the water reabsorption, aldosterone will increase the sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, and H plus secretion. ANP will decrease the sodium reabsorption. Now, there are some other hormones which act on the tubule. Let's see what, are, what is going to be the sites, right? Now, ANP. ANP will act on the glomerulus as well. It causes a afferent arteriolar dilatation. And it also causes a mesangial cell Afferent, uh, what is the action of ANP? Let me just tell you here. ANP will act atrial natriuretic peptide. This will cause an afferent arteriolar dilatation and a mesangial cell relaxation. And because of that, this will increase the GFR. Atrial natriuretic peptide in the collecting duct, we have said it decreases sodium reabsorption. But at the level of the glomerulus, what is acting on the glomerulus? Glomerulus, the hor hormone which is uh, acting is going to be atrial natriuretic peptide. At the level of glomerulus, it increases the GFR. At the collecting duct, it decreases sodium reabsorption. Okay? Now, in the PCT, which are the hormones which act on the PCT now? Hormones acting on the PCT. Number one, angiotensin two. It increases the sodium reabsorption. Please understand when you say reabsorption means it goes from the tubular lumen into the blood, into the surrounding capillaries. When I say secretion, that means it comes from the blood into the tubular lumen. Okay. Angiotensin II increases sodium reabsorption in the PCT. Another hormone which acts on the PCT is parathormone. And what is the effect of parathormone? It decreases the inorganic phosphorus reabsorption. What is PI? PI is inorganic phosphorus. Right? 
ANP causes an afferent arterial dilatation. Dilatation. D I L dilatation. And a mesangial cell relaxation, which increases the GFR. PCT angiotensin 2 increases sodium reabsorption. Parathormone also acts on PCT and it decreases phosphorus reabsorption. That means it increases the urinary loss. It increases the urinary loss of inorganic phosphorus. It increases the urinary loss of inorganic phosphorus, which is known as, which is known as phosphaturic action. Phospho, which is known as a phosphaturic action of parathormone. Phosphaturic action of parathormone. Parathormone in the PCT, it decreases phosphorus reabsorption. You know, parathormone, what does parathormone do to the plasma calcium levels? Increases it. Phosphorus levels are reduced. How does it reduce the phosphorus levels? Because it decreases the phosphorus reabsorption and increases the urinary loss of phosphorus, which is known as a phosphaturic action of parathormone. Thick ascending limb. Angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 increases the sodium reabsorption. Angiotensin 2 increases the sodium reabsorption in the thick ascending limb. DCT. DCT, you have the action of parathormone and parathormone will increase the calcium reabsorption. It will increase the calcium reabsorption in the DCT. Parathormone has got two actions on the, on the kidney. Now, in the PCT, it reduces phosphorus reabsorption. In the DCT, it increases the calcium reabsorption. Okay? So these are the hormones which act on different segments of the nephron. Right? Hormone acting on the glomerulus, ANP, causes afferent arterial dilatation and a mesangial cell relaxation, increasing GFR. Hormones acting on PCT, angiotensin 2 increases sodium reabsorption. Parathormone decreases phosphorus reabsorption. Thick ascending limb, angiotensin 2 increases sodium reabsorption. DCT, parathormone increases calcium reabsorption. Rahul Kashyap, I told you at the beginning of this chapter, mesangial cell contraction causes kinking. Mesangial cell and therefore decreases GFR. Mesangial cell relaxation will have a reverse effect, increases GFR, right? Hormones acting on the collecting duct, let's see. Hormones which act on the collecting duct, ADH, which increases water reabsorption, aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, and increases H plus secretion. ANP reduces sodium reabsorption. So ANP is acting on the glomerulus, increasing GFR, and acting on the collecting duct, it reduces sodium reabsorption. Now, what I was trying to tell you about cortical and juxtamedullary nephrons was, it is the juxtamedullary nephrons which have got thin and thick segments, right? What are these juxtamedullary nephrons and cortical nephrons? If you see this diagram here, Cortical nephrons are 85% of the total. The loop of Henle also lies in the cortex. There is no thin or thick segment. Juxtamedullary nephron is 15% of the total. Loop of Henle is in the medulla. And loop of Henle has got descending thin segment, ascending thin segment, and a thick ascending lip. Are we clear with that? Right? So this is how this is what I meant by cortical and juxtamedullary. Okay. Uh, these are the hormones which act on different segments of the nephron. Now, you had a neat question which said, which of the following hormones acts on PCT? Which of the following hormones act on PCT? Is it going to be ADH? Is it going to be aldosterone? Is it going to be A and B? Or is it going to be angiotensin 2? Bolo. What is it going to be? A, B, C, or D, which is the hormone which acts on the PCT? Angiotensin 2. Yes, SPS, you were asking me how to remember this. You've been able to answer this question now. 
If you're able to ask him, uh, answer this question, then there is no problem. You've remembered it. Yes. Why do you look for a mnemonic for everything? Ultimately, what happens? You forget what the mnemonic was for him. And sometimes I even forget what that mnemonic meant. So it's better to understand this. Try and keep this image in your mind, which I've just drawn, to see what is going to be the answer to this question. Okay. Yes, there are no hormones acting on the descending thin segment. Okay. All right. Now, this is as far as your uh, hormones acting on different segments is concerned. Next, let's go on to uh, what is the renal handling of sodium? Let's see renal handling of sodium. Renal handling of sodium. Now, let's see this here. Now, as far as renal handling of sodium is concerned, first, let's see what is going to be the filtration rate. Filtration rate of sodium. Yes, I want to calculate what is going to be the filtration rate of sodium. That means basically, I want to know, see, sodium is a freely filtered substance, right? I want to know that the uh, how to calculate how much of the sodium is filtered per day. Right? Now to calculate the filtration rate of sodium, I've already told you the formula. The formula is GFR, GFR into plasma concentration of sodium. How much is GFR? GFR is 180 liters per day. Plasma concentration of sodium is 140 millimoles per liter. So if you if you sort of solve this, right? If you uh, sorry, if you solve this, liter and liter will get cancelled. 180 into 140. I think this is 25,200 millimoles of sodium is being filtered per day. Yes. This is the amount, huge amount of sodium filtration by the kidney. Yes. How do you calculate what is filtration rate? Filtration rate is uh, uh, filtration rate is GFR into plasma concentration. What is GFR? 180 liters per day. What is the plasma concentration of sodium? 140 millimoles per liter. And like I said, if you calculate this, this comes to 25,000. To, this is the, this is huge amount of sodium which is going to be filtered per day. Yes. If there is no reabsorption of sodium, losing this much of sodium would have meant that very rapidly all of us would have gone into, into hypovolemia and collapsed. Isn't it? Because sodium is my most osmotically active particle in the ECF. It is helping to maintain the blood volume. I've got to This is the most osmotically active particle. So I cannot afford to. Um, I cannot. I cannot afford to use lose this much of sodium every day. So what happens is. Sodium will be reabsorbed in all segments of the nephron. Sodium is reabsorbed in all segments of the nephron. All segments of the nephron. Except the descending thin segment. Sodium will be reabsorbed in all segments of the nephron except the descending thin segment. Okay? So let us see what is going to be the mechanism of sodium reabsorption in the PCT. In the PCT, almost 60% of the sodium is reabsorbed. Sodium is going to be reabsorbed in the PCT itself. Yes, PCT itself. So let us see what is the mechanism of sodium reabsorption in the PCT. This is the PCT cell. GFR Yashwant is 180 liters per day. 180 liters per day, not 120. In ml per minute, it is 125. Unit ke upar dhyan do, yashmant, ye liters per day mein hai. To 180. ml per minute hai, to 125. Okay? All right. 
PCT sodium is going to be reabsorbed. 60% of sodium is reabsorbed in the PCT. And I've already discussed with you in the first chapter. On the basal side of the PCT cells, you have the action of the sodium potassium pump, which reabsorbs three sodium and brings in two potassium. Reabsorbs three sodium and brings in two potassium. This was primary active transport or the basolateral membrane. On the luminal membrane, towards the lumen, lumen is towards where the brush border will be towards the lumen, you have a secondary active transport. Sodium moves along its electrochemical gradient created by sodium potassium pump and some other substance will move in the same direction as sodium. In that case, it is called a secondary active co-transport or also known as symport. Secondary active co-transport and seconds or symport. Sodium, if this other substance moves in a direction opposite to direction of sodium, we call it a secondary active. Counter transport, counter transport or also known as an anti port, right? So secondary active co-transport and secondary active counter transport in the PCT. Basal side, you have the action of the sodium potassium pump. So in the PCT, you have a sodium glucose co-transport, sodium glucose co-transport, okay? Secondary active co-transport, what are the examples of secondary active co-transport in the PCT? Secondary active co-transport in the PCT is sodium glucose co-transport, sodium amino acid co-transport and sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport. These are the three co-transports which happen in the PCT. Sodium glucose, sodium amino acid and sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport. There is a secondary active antiport and that is Na plus H plus antiport, right? This is what happens in the PCT. Sodium glucose, sodium amino acids, sodium inorganic phosphorus. Now, please remember, what is the hormone which acts over here? Remember we said parathormone. Parathormone will inhibit the sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport. It inhibits the sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport. So what will happen to the urinary loss of phosphorus? Increases, right? Which is called the phosphaturic action of parathormone. Now, remember, there are two uh, there is a sodium inorganic phosphorus 2A protein and sodium inorganic phosphorus 2C protein. PCT has got both sodium inorganic phosphorus 2A and sodium inorganic phosphorus 2C protein. Parathormone selectively inhibits the 2A protein. It does not act on 2C. There is 2A and 2C here. It selectively inhibits the 2A protein. This is the phosphaturic action of parathormone. Please look at this once again. In the PCT, 60% of the sodium is going to be absorbed. Basal side, primary active transport. Luminal side, secondary active co- and counter transport. Which are the co-transport mechanisms here? Sodium glucose, sodium amino acid, sodium inorganic phosphorus. The hormone acting on sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport is parathormone. Parathormone selectively inhibits sodium inorganic phosphorus 2A protein. There is a counter transport, which is sodium H plus, right? Sodium H plus counter transport. Now, uh, this is in the PCT. Next, let's go on to the DTS, the descending thin segment. The descending thin segment of the loop of Henle, 
the descending thin segment of loop of Henle, there is no sodium reabsorption. I told you sodium is reabsorbed in, in all parts of the nephron except the descending thin segment. You know, like the thin and the thick limbs of loop of Henle, right? This is the descending thin segment, this is the ascending thin segment, and this is thick ascending limb. Sodium is, there is no reabsorption of sodium in the descending thin segment. Right? Descending thin segment, there is going to be no reabsorption. I've already written it down, Abhishek Patil, sodium right at the beginning of the section. I wrote that. Sodium is reabsorbed in all parts of the nephron. I, Abhishek Patil, I write everything that I speak and I write with you so that there is, I do not go very fast or very slow so I can monitor my speed and I try and write everything that I speak. Right? Okay, so descending thin segment, there is no reabsorption of sodium. Sodium is reabsorbed in all parts of the nephron except the descending thin segment. Now, yes, Sakshi Patidar, it is reabsorbed in all parts of the loop of Henle of a cortical nephron. Okay. Now, the next is, um, let's see what is the mechanism in the ascending thin segment. Ascending thin segment, there is a passive reabsorption. There is a passive reabsorption of sodium and chloride. There is a passive reabsorption uh, of sodium and chloride. Then you come to thick ascending, thick ascending limb. Thick ascending limb. Yes. Thick ascending limb. Thick ascending limb. 30% of sodium is reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. 30% of the sodium is reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. So let us see what is the mechanism. Babu number three, um, parathormone sodium ki excretion ko nahi badhaega. Kyu? Because sodium ki, ki, ki reabsorption ke liye bohat sare mechanisms hain. Phosphorus ke liye ek hi tha. Right? So parathormone interferes with the reabsorption of phosphorus, not sodium. Sodium, there are so many other mechanisms for absorption of sodium. Thick ascending limb, 30% of sodium is going to be reabsorbed. Again, on the basal side, you have the activity of Sodium potassium pump, there is three sodium and two potassium. Three sodium and two potassium. On the opposite side of the membrane, you have a secondary active. Secondary active co-transport. Secondary active co-transport. There is an Na plus K plus two Cl minus co-transport, secondary active co-transport on the duminal side. There is an Na plus K plus two Cl minus co-transport, Na plus K plus two Cl minus co-transport. Okay, Na plus K plus two Cl minus co-transport, which is the which is the which is the diuretic which acts on Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus co-transport, the diuretic which acts over here, the diuretic which acts over here are the loop diuretics, Lasics. Loop diuretics will act on Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus Co-transport, it causes increased urinary loss. Yes, loop diuretic, sodium, potassium, and chloride. Next, let's see. 
So 60% of sodium reabsorbed in the BCT, 30% in the thick ascending limb. Now let's see DCT. In the DCT, you have 7%. DCT, you have 7% of sodium reabsorption. DCT, you have 7% of sodium reabsorption. Let's see what is the mechanism of sodium reabsorption in the DCT. Hirva Manoj, loop diuretic, nahi hai, loop. Hai. <laughs> okay. Basal side, sodium potassium pump. Right? Please, please remember wherever sodium is absorbed, whether it is in the kidney, GI tract, salivary glands, anywhere, wherever sodium is absorbed, basolateral membrane there has to be a sodium potassium pump. Why not a sodium, why a sodium potassium pump? Because sodium in the cells is much lower than in the plasma. So when sodium moves from the cells to the plasma, it is against a concentration gradient. So it needs energy. Basolateral membrane will always have a sodium potassium pump. Right? This will be um, uh, because the movement of sodium from cells to the blood is against a concentration, against a concentration gradient, right? Please remember there is a line. There is a line in your textbook which says reabsorption of sodium is an energy consuming process. Energy consuming process. Why reabsorption sodium is an energy consuming process? Because I said, whenever sodium moves from cell to plasma, it is against a concentration gradient. It needs energy. Okay. So this is your, um, uh, Basolateral membrane, sodium potassium pump. Luminal side, you have an Na plus Cl minus. Na plus Cl minus co-transport, which is a diuretic which acts on Na plus Cl minus co-transport. This is thiazides. Thiazides will act on the DCT. Thiazides can affect 7% of sodium reabsorption. Maximum sodium reabsorption in the PCT, 60%, 30% in thick ascending limb. Loop diuretics will interfere with sodium reabsorption in thick ascending limb and in the DCT, thiazides. 60% sodium is reabsorbed in PCT, 30% in thick ascending limb, 7% in DCT, 97% of sodium is already reabsorbed. How much of sodium is left? 3%. Now this 3% of sodium will be under the control of aldosterone, right? So late DCT, late DCT and the collecting duct, late DCT and collecting duct, this is involved in 3% of sodium reabsorption, which is under the control of aldosterone. Aldosterone will control this 3% of sodium reabsorption. Now, late DCT, you have two types of cells, which are called P cells and I cells. P cells and I cells. P cells are principal cells. I cells are intercalated cells. Intercalated cells. P cells in the late DCT and collecting duct, they are involved in sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, and water reabsorption. Late DCT and the collecting duct, this is late DCT and collecting duct. There are two types of cells. They are histologically similar. Histologically similar, P cells and I cells. P cells are principal cells and I cells are intercalated cells. Okay. Surbhi Srivastava, that's not true. 
It is loop diuretics, which are the strongest diuretics. Is it if? Yes? All right. Sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, water reabsorption, intercalate cells are involved in H plus secretion. H plus secretion. And how do I remember that? Remember, acid has got an I. So I cells are involved in the secretion of uh, uh, H plus. Okay? H plus. Are we clear with that? Right? Uh, Jabira Ahmad's DCT is secondary active transport. Na plus, K, C, Na plus Cl minus co transport is secondary active. Okay? Right. Sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion, and water reabsorption, I cells in secretion of acid. So let us see how does sodium reabsorption take place in the Sakshi Patidar. No, this is not a, uh, they do not contribute more to GFR. Please understand. They are, they cause a concentration of urine. There is a difference. Now let's see what happens in the P cells. P cells are involved in sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion and water reabsorption. Again, on the basal side of the cell, you have the action of sodium potassium pump, which pumps out three sodium and brings in two potassium. So what happens is the activity of the sodium potassium pump decreases the intracellular concentration of sodium. It decreases the intracellular concentration of sodium. So what will happen is on the luminal side, there are special channels which are present. There are special channels which are present, which are called epithelial sodium channels. Epithelial sodium channels. So sodium will move passively through these epithelial sodium channels, right? Epithelial sodium channels. K plus will be secreted passively. K plus is secreted passively. Sodium is reabsorbed. This is a passive reabsorption of sodium through epithelial sodium channels. And there is a secretion of potassium, which is also passive. Right? Now, what is the effect of aldosterone? What is the effect of aldosterone? Aldosterone will increase the number and activity of sodium potassium ATPase pumps. We've done this in the first chapter. Sodium potassium, uh, aldosterone will also increase the number of epithelial sodium channels, right? Epithelial sodium channels. So what is the effect of aldosterone? Aldosterone will increase the sodium reabsorption. It will also increase the potassium secretion. And by action on the eye cells, it will increase the H plus secretion. This is the action on the eye cells. It increases sodium reabsorption, increases the potassium secretion. How does it do that? On the basal side of the cell, it will increase the activity of the sodium potassium pumps and number and activity. And on the luminal side, it increases the number of epithelial sodium channels. ENACs are epithelial sodium channels. So sodium reabsorption is increased and potassium secretion is also increased. And by action on the eye cells, it increases the H plus secretion. Right? Now, what can increase aldosterone? Aldosterone is under the control of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Anything which increases renin will increase aldosterone. Yes? Anything which increases renin could be hemorrhage, hypovolemia, dehydration, hyponatremia, all of that. Anything which increases renin will increase aldosterone. Yes? 
and also an increase in potassium increase in plasma levels of potassium has a direct effect in increasing aldosterone secretion and aldosterone what will it do to potassium levels plasma potassium levels it will increase the urinary loss of potassium so plasma potassium levels will reduce which is so important because you've done it in the first chapter hyperkalemia has got disastrous consequences hyperkalemia causes arrhythmias we've discussed this in the first chapter itself right so whenever there is an increase in the dietary intake of potassium the day you have let's say six bananas or something banana is very rich in potassium or nariyal pani yes very rich in potassium plasma potassium levels increase immediately there is increase in aldosterone secretion aldosterone will increase the urinary loss of potassium so potassium levels will come back to normal please please understand decrease in sodium will increase the renin mechanism not it will not cause a direct increase in aldosterone but increase in potassium will directly increase aldosterone right so this is as far as the aldosterone action is concerned right so let's see this once again once again just a brief recap pct we said there is a huge amount of filtration of sodium per day so sodium needs to be reabsorbed in all segments of the nephron except the descending thin segment in the pct 60% of sodium is going to be reabsorbed basal side sodium potassium pump luminal side secondary active co transport and secondary active counter transport i've given you the examples descending thin segment no reabsorption of sodium ascending thin segment there is a passive reabsorption when i say passive that means there are some channels which are present there is a passive reabsorption it's not secondary active thick ascending limb is 30% this is secondary active co transport basal side sodium potassium pump dct 7 60% is absorbed in pct 30% in thick ascending limb dct 7% 7% is secondary active this is a secondary active co transport on the luminal side secondary active co transport because you have a primary active transport on the basal side late dct and the collecting duct late late dct and the collecting duct there are two types of cells p cells and i cells p cells are involved in sodium reabsorption potassium secretion and water reabsorption aldosterone increases the number and activity of sodium potassium pump on the basal side and on the luminal side you have epithelial sodium channels so there is now um, aldosterone like i said is under the control of the renin mechanism but increase in potassium can directly increase aldosterone please please remember decrease in sodium will cause increase in renin renin will increase aldosterone but increase in potassium will directly increase aldosterone increase in potassium is a direct stimulus this is a direct stimulus for aldosterone for aldosterone for aldosterone uh, increase right aldosterone will also increase the h plus secretion but that is the action on the i cells yes now again there was a question which said hyperaldosteronism 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 can never cause hyperaldosteronism can never cause acidosis or alkalosis acidosis vivek tata uh, vivek this is a uh, decrease sodium in the blood right hyper hyperaldosteronism can never cause a acidosis or alkalosis uh, acidosis and alkalosis also means in the blood right hyperaldosteronism can never cause acidosis isn't it it can never cause acidosis why please remember this is in the blood we are talking about acidosis it cannot cause because what is the action of aldosterone aldosterone will increase the urinary loss of h plus so acidosis is not a possibility 
right? In fact, hyperaldosteronism will cause an alkalosis. Alkalosis. It will cause alkalosis plus a hypokalemia. Remember, alkalosis has K low. K low. That means hypokalemia. Right? Alkalosis may be K low. So if you remember that, hyperaldosteronism will cause alkalosis plus a hypokalemia. Why hypokalemia? It increases the urinary, it increases the secretion of potassium. Right? So this is as far as your um, aldosterone is concerned. Two important diuretics which act over here. Anti-aldosterone, spironolactone. Spironolactone is anti-aldosterone. A diuretic which acts on the epithelial sodium ch channels is amyloride. A diuretic which acts over here is amyloride. Right? So this is as far as your uh, the uh, renal handling of sodium is concerned. Two important points. Sodium is reabsorbed uh, in all parts of the nephron except the descending thin segment. Maximum sodium reabsorption in the PCT. Where aldosterone controls 3% of sodium reabsorption in late DCT and collecting duct. And uh, number four, you must remember, wherever sodium is absorbed, basal side, you will have a sodium potassium pump. Now, this is um, for sodium. Let's see the next one, and that is for potassium. Is sodium partly or completely reabsorbed molecule? See, you must understand, um, when I say, uh, uh, Daniel, if you could just listen to this, it all depends upon, see, aldosterone is complete, is, is controlling 3% of sodium absorption, right? 3% uh, of sodium reabsorption, right? So that means that the, uh, if aldosterone secretion is high, sodium can be completely reabsorbed. So if you have a patient, if you have, let's say, if there is a drop in sodium levels, let's say, for example, excessive sweating, aldosterone secretion, there is a hyponatremia. Aldosterone secretion is very high. All of the sodium gets reabsorbed. But if aldosterone secretion is low, sodium will be lost. So I cannot say, is it 100% reabsorbed? No. Because that 3% is being controlled by this, that is going to determine the final amount of sodium in urine, depending upon how much of aldosterone. Okay? Next, let's see K plus. Pradipta gain, abhi tak mein kya bata rahi thi? Har ek diuretic ka site of action bata diya. Jabira Habib, that is called aldosterone escape, that will do it in CVS. Jabira will do it in CVS. Now, K plus, let's see. The, let's see what is going to be the filtration rate of, filtration rate of potassium. Yes, triamterene as well, absolutely. Filtration rate of potassium. Yes, Minidar, we will complete the renal system. Q may go heart attack there. What is the filtration rate of potassium? Right? At what rate is potassium going to be filtered? Now, again, we have already discussed GFR into the plasma concentration of potassium. GFR into plasma concentration of potassium. Now, GFR is 180 liters per day. This is 180 liters per day. How much is the plasma potassium level? This is 4. This is 3.5 to 5 millimoles. So, I'm taking it as 4. Um, Four millimoles per day, uh, four millimoles per liter. That is the 
potassium level. Liter and liter gets cancelled. If I if I solve this, this is 720 millimoles of potassium is being filtered per day, much less than sodium. Sodium was 25,200. This is just 720 millimoles of potassium per day. So do I need as many mechanisms for sodium reabsorption? Do I need the same number of mechanisms for potassium reabsorption as for sodium reabsorption? No. Sodium is filtered to the extent of 25,200. This is not even a thousand. So I do not need many mechanisms for sodium reabsorption. Right? Donald Modi, why are we concerned about Donald Modi? Why are we so concerned about sodium and potassium? Refer to the first chapter. Sodium, most osmotically active particle in the ECF. It is maintaining the blood volume. Potassium levels are most important as far as excitability of cells are concerned. These are two of your most important ions in the plasma. Right? Okay. Seven. Um, so I do not need many mechanisms for potassium reabsorption. But let us see what happens. Now, potassium is an ion which is both reabsorbed and secreted. This is both reabsorbed and secreted. This is both reabsorbed and secreted. Again, this is a neat question. Which ion is both reabsorbed and secreted? And that is... Um, this both reabsorbed and secreted, and this is potassium. Okay. Where does the reabsorption of sodium? Where does the reabsorption of sodium take place? Reabsorption of sodium will be in the PCT. <laughs> reabsorption of sodium will be in the PCT, right? And also in the thick ascending limb, thick ascending limb, thick ascending limb. I've already done the mechanism with you. It is an Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus co-transport. Thick ascending limb. This is Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus co-transport. It is a secondary active co-transport. Yes. So potassium is going to be reabsorbed in the PCT and the thick ascending. Thick ascending limb we've already done. In the PCT, there are two mechanisms for potassium reabsorption. Two mechanisms for potassium reabsorption. There is what is known as Tum look typing ban karo, then I will not get distracted. All right, so potassium. Yes, we are just discussing potassium. Potassium is both reabsorbed and secreted. Reabsorption of potassium takes place in the PCT and in the thick ascending limb. In the PCT, there are two mechanisms for potassium reabsorption, and that is passive and active. In the thick ascending limb, secondary active co transport, right? Passive is by a mechanism which is known as solvent drag. Passive reabsorption of potassium in the PCT is by what is known as solvent drag. Now, what is solvent drag? See, PCT, there is a huge amount of water. The solvent in plasma in urine is water. So in the PCT, there's a two thirds of water is absorbed and along with uh, absorption of water, there is also some absorption of dissolved solids, including potassium. Right. So this is your. Um, Solvent drag. What is solvent drag? In the PCT, two-thirds of the water is absorbed. In the PCT, 
two thirds of water is reabsorbed and two thirds of water is reabsorbed along with water, along with reabsorption of water, along with water, dissolved solutes including potassium are reabsorbed. This is known as solvent drag, right? This is known, solvent drag means they're being dragged along with that absorption of water. Huge amount of water reabsorption is taking place in the PCT. Along with reabsorption of water, dissolved solutes are going to be reabsorbed. Please remember, compared to sodium, there is very little potassium in the tubal fluid. And uh, most of this potassium is being absorbed dissolved in water itself. For sodium, this is not going to be an important mechanism because there is a huge amount of sodium absorbed, so sodium present in the tubular fluid. But for potassium, this is an important mechanism by solvent drag, right? For all solutes, now see, what is what is the solvent drag? If you see this a little more carefully, when I look at the PCT cell, Right. This is what the PCT cell looks like. There is a brush water. Okay. And there is also, this is a neighboring cell here. Okay. This is what a PCT cell looks like. Here you have the blood vessel. So when I say water is being absorbed, two thirds of water, Water will enter into the cells via what is known as aquaporin. Aqua, aquaporin 1. Yes, aquaporin. The aquaporin are water channels. But water also, water also manages to go between the cells. Water and the dissolved solutes, water and the dissolved solutes manage to go between the cells. Remember, we had spoken about in the first um, first chapter, between the PCT cells, you have tight junctions, yes, which should not allow any movement of water. But PCT has got leaky tight junctions. They are tight junctions, all right. They are definitely tight junctions, but these tight junctions are also leaky. In the collecting duct, you have tight, tight junctions, but in the PCT, you've got leaky tight junctions, leaky tight junctions. And leaky means some amount of water manages to pass between the cells through these tight junctions, paracellular. Right, and this is paracellular, and th these are uh, water plus dissolved solutes manages manage to pass between the cells, and this is known as solvent drag. Now, remember, all solutes are are moving by solvent drag, but for potassium, this becomes an important mechanism because there is such so little potassium that the solvent drag becomes the major mechanism of potassium reabsorption. Okay. Now, if potassium has to go through channels, potassium is in a low concentration here, high concentration here, so it will need an active transport. There has to be, this movement will have to be active. But which is this pump which is involved, we do not know. Potassium can move passively in the PCT via solvent drag, but if it has to go through the cell, it has to be active with the help of a pump. And which is this pump? We do not know, right? And it cannot be the sodium potassium pump because sodium potassium pump is only on the basolateral membrane. I understood, right? So that is why I said that there is uh, potassium reabsorption. The PCT will be passive by solvent drag and active, but which is the pump which is involved, we do not know. Clear? And it is not the sodium potassium pump, because sodium potassium pump is only on the basolateral membrane. 
Reabsorption is also in the thick ascending limb, that is by uh, Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus co-transport, which is a secondary active transport. Then, uh, secretion. Secretion of potassium I have already done. Secretion is in the collecting duct, P cells, and this is under the control of aldosterone. We've already done that. Whatever causes increase in renin and aldosterone will increase the secretion of potassium. I've discussed it with you in the handling of sodium. Right? So potassium is an ion which is both reabsorbed and secreted. Where does the reabsorption take place? Reabsorption of the PCT mainly by passive mechanism, which is known as solvent drag, also actively, but which is the pump which is involved, we do not know. In the thick ascending limb, it is an Na plus K plus 2 Cl minus co transport, which is a secondary active transport. Secretion occurs in the P cells of the collecting duct under the influence of the hormone aldosterone. So this is potassium handling by the kidney. Let's have a look at how does the, cal how does the kidney handle calcium. Why is an active pump needed? Because potassium is in a very high concentration inside the cells. Isn't it Ajitesh? First chapter, potassium is high intracellularly. All right. Now, calcium. Let's have a look at calcium. Calcium is also, now if you look at plasma calcium levels, Plasma calcium you have, this is divided into, there is a free, the total plasma calcium. Total plasma calcium is divided into free and the bound calcium. Akshita Jai Kumar, beta secretion means what? Secretion means from blood to urine. I can't do it. Blood to urine. So if I increase the potassium secretion, what will happen to the plasma potassium levels? Reduce, na? Akshita, basics, beta, basics. Now, free and bound, and 50% of the total plasma calcium is free and 50% is bound. Now, it is the free calcium which is going to be filtered, not the bound calcium. Not the bound calcium. Bound calcium is bound to proteins, so it is not going to be filtered. It is a free calcium which is going to be filtered. Right? Approximately 99% of the filtered calcium. 99% of the filtered calcium is going to be reabsorbed. Filtered calcium is going to be reabsorbed. Less than 1% is going to be excreted. Less than 1% is excreted. 99% of filtered calcium is reabsorbed. Less than 1% is excreted. The sites and mechanisms Sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption is similar to sodium. Sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption is similar to sodium. So that means if I ask you a question, maximum calcium reabsorption, maximum calcium reabsorption, this will be in the PCT. 60% of the filtered calcium will be reabsorbed in the PCT. It is sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption absolutely similar to sodium. Maximum calcium reabsorption will be PCT. Parathormone increases calcium reabsorption in TCT. Again, this was an important question. These are both neat questions which have been asked. Maximum calcium reabsorption, PCT, parathormone will increase the calcium reabsorption in DCT, right? Sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption, like I said, similar to sodium. If you remember, side effects of uh, loop diuretics, loop diuretics 
can cause hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, right? All of these are absorbed in the thick ascending limb and loop diuretics can cause decrease in sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, right? So all of this can happen in the, because of Lasix, right? So remember the sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption similar to sodium. Maximum calcium reabsorption in CT, Parathormone increases the calcium reabsorption in DCT. Let's have a look at another divalent ion, divalent ion and that is magnesium. Again, magnesium is said to Nay Bitash Suhas Pankat Singh. Parathormone increases calcium reabsorption in DCT. Magnesium is handled similar to calcium, but very important difference, maximum magnesium reabsorption. Maximum magnesium reabsorption in, is in the thick ascending limb. And this again has been asked as a question. Maximum magnesium reabsorption is in the thick ascending limb. Total amount of calcium reabsorption, different sites, 60% in PCT, 30% in thick ascending limb, 7% in DCT, uh, uh, less than 1% is going to be reabsorbed, in, uh, is going to be excreted. Have you understood? Similar to sodium, absolutely similar to sodium. Okay? All right. Okay, so this is as far as your calcium is concerned. Calcium, out of the total plasma calcium, 50%, which is free, is going to be filtered. Out of the filtered calcium, 99% will be reabsorbed in different segments, maximum in PCT, 30% in thick ascending, and just similar to sodium. Less than 1% is excreted. Sites and mechanism of action, uh, sites and mechanism of calcium reabsorption, similar to sodium. Maximum calcium reabsorption in PCT, parathormone increases calcium reabsorption in DCT. Maximum magnesium reabsorption in thick ascending limb. Andrew, where does it come from? Parathormone increases 1% reabsorption of potassium. What are you talking about, Andrew? Parathormone does not affect potassium. Parathormone affects calcium and phosphorus. Potassium can't say P is not potassium. P is phosphorus. K is potassium. Andrew, what are you doing, beta? Concentrate. Parathormone, can it increase richer pressure? Does it increase sodium or does it calcium reabsorption? Okay, so this is as far as your um, magnesium is concerned. Let's see another um, substance which is handled by the kidney. All right, let's have a look at glucose. Let's see how does the kidney handle glucose. Now, glucose, important points about glucose is, yes, similar glucose. The amount of glucose reabsorbed is, what is the site of glucose reabsorption? Site of glucose reabsorption, this is only PCT. Glucose is reabsorbed only in the PCT. How much is the amount of, how much is the amount of, um, glucose reabsorption, 100%. What is the mechanism of glucose absorption? Glucose absorption. Let's see mechanism of glucose absorption. Shake Ahmed, yes, magnesium reabsorption, similar to calcium, except maximum magnesium reabsorption is in thick ascending limb. How does aldosterone cause alkalosis? Because it increases urinary loss of H+. Kuldeep Tyagi, urinary loss of H+, agar badega, to plasma mein H+, kam hoga. H+, kam hoga, to alkalosis hoga. Okay? 
See, Lasix Neelam can cause increased urinary loss of sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium. Hypocalcemia bhi hota hai na? Patients in, on long-term Lasix, hypomagnesemia bhi hota hai. Right? Okay. Now, mechanism of glucose absorption. On the basal side, you have the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Three sodium, two potassium. On the luminal side, you have a sodium glucose co-transport. Sodium glucose co-transport. This is a secondary active co-transport, secondary active co-transport. This is known as SGLT. What is SGLT? Sodium glucose linked transport. SGLT is sodium glucose linked transport. Sodium glucose linked transport and on the basal side you have what is known as this is GLUT Two. GLUT2 is an example of facilitated diffusion. GLUT2 is an example of facilitated diffusion, right? GLUT2 is an example of facilitated diffusion. On the luminal side, you have a secondary active co-transport and on the basal side, you've got a facilitated diffusion for the absorption of glucose. This is now remember, early PCT, early PCT, there is SGLT2 and GLUT2. Late PCT, late PCT, SGLT1 and GLUT1. But most, most of the glucose reabsorption occurs in the early PCT. Early PCT. Early PCT is SGLT2 and GLUT2. SGLT, what is SGLT? Sodium glucose linked transport. Secondary active co-transport in the early PCT, SGLT2 and GLUT2. In late PCT, SGLT1 and GLUT1. Please remember these both GLUT2 and GLUT1, these are insulin independent GLUTs. These are insulin independent. The insulin dependent GLUT is GLUT4, which is on adipocytes and muscle cells, resting skeletal muscle cells. Right? So this is these are insulin independent. Remember, major uh, the majority of glucose reabsorption is by SGLT2 and GLUT2. SGLT2 and GLUT2. Now, when you look at the glucose absorption, there are two extremely important terms that you must know. Glucose absorption, the first term is what do you understand by renal threshold. What do you understand by renal threshold? And what do you understand by TMG? Right? There are two extremely important terms that I need to discuss with you and that is two extremely important terms that I need to discuss with you. What is renal threshold and what is TMG? What is TMG? We've done TM in the first class. TM in the first class, if, I remember, if you remember, it was called transport maxima, right? And if you remember, I told you, transport maxima means it's a maximum rate of transport, right? All carrier-mediated transports will have a maximum rate. Now, renal threshold and TMG, what is the difference between the two? Renal threshold is the plasma concentration. Renal threshold is plasma concentration beyond which, beyond which glucose begins to appear in, begins to appear in the urine. 
plasma concentration beyond which glucose begins to appear in the urine. And this is 180 to 200. Somebody had written Rushi Acharya, you wrote 180, but you must remember the units. Units is milligrams per deciliter. Or you can also write it as 2 milligram per ml. 2 milligram per ml. TNG, TNG is a maximum rate of glucose reabsorption. Wherever carriers are involved, there is going to be a maximum rate. This is a renal threshold is a concentration. TNG is a rate. Renal threshold is per unit volume. TNG will be per unit time. TNG in case of males, this is 375 milligrams per minute. In the case of females, this is 300 milligrams per minute. Right? 375 milligrams per minute and this is 300 milligrams per minute in the case of females. This is TNG and renal threshold. Both are two absolutely different things. One is a concentration, so it is per unit volume, right? So renal threshold is per unit volume, whereas TNG is per, it's a rate, so it has to be per unit time. Yes, per unit time. Right? So this is the difference between renal threshold and TNG. Let's have a look at the next substance. Uh, next, next, we've discussed sodium, potassium, we've discussed uh, calcium, magnesium, glucose. Let's look at the next thing and that is how does the kidney handle? How does the kidney handle water? Let's see. Uh, M. Sravya, this is GLUT, the GLUT2, GLUT1 are insulin dependent. Okay. okay. Let us now try and see how does the kidney handle water. Water handling by the kidney. Now, if you see this, Okay. Harshita, kya likh rahe beta? Harshita, I said plasma concentration beyond which agar plasma ki concentration, glucose concentration plasma mein 180 se zyada hai, to glucose urine mein aega. Okay? Okay. Kya ho gaya? Kya likh rahe ho? What happened? GLUT4 is insulin dependent. GLUT1 and 2 are insulin independent. They do not depend upon insulin. Insulin dependent GLUT. Insulin dependent. Where did I say dependent? Insulin dependent is GLUT4. This is in adipocytes and in in adipocytes and in resting skeletal muscles. And in cardiac cells. This is what I was saying. Pancreas is GLUT2. Sub Subra Jyoti Day, it's GLUT2 beta. Insulin dependent is only GLUT4, which is an adipocytes, resting skeletal muscles and cardiac muscle cells. What are the target organs for insulin? Insulin acts on adipocytes, resting skeletal muscles and cardiac muscles. It has the GLUT4 is insulin dependent. GLUT2, GLUT1 are insulin independent. Okay. Next. Let's see water reabsorption in the kidney. 
Now, as far as water reabsorption in the kidney is concerned, let us see. Now, what is the GFR? GFR per day, like I told you, GFR, how much of water is present in the filtrate? 180. 180 liters per day it is what is going to be filtered, right? 180 liters per day. Okay. Now this is filtered. Now two thirds of the water is going to be reabsorbed in the PCT itself. And this is with the help of water channels, which are called aquaporin 1. Aquaporin 1. Yes. The amount of water filtered per day is 180 liters. 180 out of which two thirds, that means 120 liters, is absorbed in the PCT of all the nephrons put together. And 120 liters means four buckets of water. One bucket is 30 liters. That is the amount of water reabsorption which occurs in the PCT. And this is known as the obligatory reabsorption of water. In the PCT, you have what is known as the obligatory re That means this obligatory reabsorption of water, right? And this is a solute-driven water reabsorption. Solute-driven water reabsorption. This is obligatory. That means this will take place. Two-thirds of whatever water is filtered will be reabsorbed in the PCT. This is called obligatory and this is solute driven. It follows the absorption of solutes. Uh -huh. Jitna solute absorb ho hai, utna water. So it's a solute driven water reabsorption. In the descending thin segment, in the descending thin segment, about 15 to 20 percent of water reabsorption. This is also with the help of aquaporin 1. 15 to 20 percent of water reabsorption in the descending thin segment because of aqua, again aquaporin 1. Then you have in the collecting duct. Collecting duct will be about 13 to 15 percent of water absorption. 13 to 15 percent of water reabsorption will take place in the collecting duct. And this water reabsorption in the collecting duct, this is under this water reabsorption in the collecting duct, it is under the under the control of ADH. Right? This is almost 23 to 25 liters. This is under the control of ADH. 13 to 15 percent of the water, 23 to 25, uh, uh, 20, uh, 23 to, in fact, 27 liters is under the control of ATH, antidiuretic hormone. And this is known as the facultative. This is known as facultative reabsorption of water. Facultative reabsorption of water. Obligatory is in the PCT in the collecting duct is facultative reabsorption of water. This is under the control of ADH. And the aquaporins that are present over here, you have aquaporin 2 on the luminal membrane. Aquaporin 2 on the luminal membrane. And aquaporin 3 and 4. Aquaporin 2 on the luminal membrane and aquaporin 3 and 4 on the basolateral membrane. Aquaporin 3 and 4 on the basolateral membrane. Aquaporin 2 on the luminal membrane and aquaporin 3 and 4 on the basolateral membrane. Right? This is as far as your facultative reabsorption of water is concerned. Please remember, ADH will increase the number of aquaporin 2. It does not affect the number of aquaporin 3 and 4. It will affect the water channels on the luminal side of the P-cells. 
more EDH, more water channels. More EDH, more water channels. More water channels means more will be the water reabsorption. More will be the water reabsorption, right? More the ADH, more the aquaporins, more will be the water reabsorption. So water reabsorption, if you look at this, maximum water reabsorption in the PCT, this is known as obligatory. Two thirds of water reabsorption will take place in the PCT, irrespective of ADH secretion. This is with the help of aquaporin one. In the descending thin segment, 15 to 20 percent of the water reabsorption, again with the help of aquaporin one. Collecting duct. Collecting duct, there is 13 to 15 percent of the water reabsorption. This is under the control of ADH and which is known as facultative reabsorption. Facultative reabsorption. This is with the help of aquaporin 2 on the luminal side and aquaporin 3 and 4 on the basolateral membrane. ADH will increase the number of aquaporin 2. ADH will increase the aquaporin 2. It does not affect aquaporin 1. It does not affect aquaporin 3 or 4. It only increases the number of aquaporin 2. No Rohangar, aldosterone is involved in sodium reabsorption, not in water reabsorption. Yes, Chinmay, only aquaporin 2 under ADH. Yes, Apurva, only aquaporin 2, not aquaporin 3 and 4. So you have an MCQ. ADH increases the number of, okay. ADH increases number of which of the following? Aquaporin 1, aquaporin 2, aquaporin 3 or aquaporin 4? Answer is aquaporin 2. Aldosterone will not absorb water. Aldosterone is involved in sodium reabsorption, potassium secretion and the H plus secretion. The next thing which we are going to which we are going to do is how does the kidney handle H plus? How does the kidney handle H plus? 23 to 27 liters. They just liters percentage nahi tha. Liter. 13 to 15 percent of water and or 23 to 25 liters. Okay. Now, how does the kidney handle H plus? Now, as far as the H plus handling by the kidney is concerned, now please remember, even though H plus is a very, uh, very small iron, there is no filtration of H plus. There is no filtration of H plus. Why is there no filtration of H plus? Because there is no free H plus, whatever H plus, because there is no free H plus, there is no, so there's going to be no filtration of H plus, isn't it? There is um, uh, all the H plus which is present in the plasma will be buffered by the bicarbonate or by the proteins. What is the pH of plasma? pH of plasma is not acidic, isn't it? It is 7.4. You understood? So this is the, there is no free H plus in the plasma. So there is going to be no filtration of plasma. But we know that urine is acidic. But urine can be acidic. Urine is acidic. Therefore, you have a secretion of H+. There is a secretion of H+, which is present. Secretion of it. There is no filtration, but urine is acidic because there is secretion, active secretion of H plus. Yes. So two important questions when, when it comes for. Two important questions. Maximum H plus secretion. Maximum H plus secretion. It occurs in maximum H plus secretion is in PCT or is it in the collecting duct? Maximum H plus secretion is in the PCT or the collecting duct. And second question is urine acidification. Urine acidification occurs in. Urine acidification will occur in 
is it going to be the PCT or the collecting duct? Yes, two important questions here. Maximum H plus secretion is in the PCT or the collecting duct, urine acidification. Maximum H plus secretion is in the PCT. Almost 4,200 millimoles of H plus is secreted per day in the PCT. In the collecting duct, it is less than 80 millimoles of H plus is secreted per day in the collecting duct. So maximum H plus is secreted in the PCT, but the urine acidification occurs in the collecting duct. The reason where, why there is no acidification in the PCT in spite of a huge amount of H plus secretion, because PCT, there is no acidification in the PCT, no acidification in the PCT because of no acidification in the PCT because of bicarbonates, because of a very good buffer in the PCT, and that is because of very good buffer in the PCT, which is bicarbonate. So th there is no acidification which happens in the PCT. Acidification is going to be in the collecting duct. That means the 4,200 millimoles of H plus which is secreted per day does not cause acidification. The less than 80 millimoles which is secreted in the collecting duct will cause uh, acidification. Right? Now let's see how does this, what happens in the PCT. Let's see what happens in the PCT. Again, PCT cell, brush border towards the lumen. All the diagrams which I've made, lumen is on your right side, basal side is the blood vessel. Now here it comes, now there is carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. In the presence of the PCT cells are very rich in carbonic anhydrase. Right? In the presence of carbonic anhydrase, this forms H2CO3, which splits into H plus and HCO3 minus. This H plus is secreted in exchange for sodium. If you remember, we've done this already. That is your Na plus H plus counter transport, which is an example of secondary active transport. There is a secondary active counter transport, Na plus H plus counter transport, which occurs in the PCT. Right? This is how carbon dioxide plus water in the PCT in the presence of carbonic anhydrase forms H2CO3. This carbon dioxide can come from the plasma, from cellular metabolism. This now combines with water to form H2CO3, which splits into H plus and HCO3 minus. This H plus is secreted in exchange for sodium, and that is secondary active counter transport. Now let's see what happens to this H plus. I told you there is a very good buffer which is present in the PCT and that is, that is a bicarbonate. There is a lot of bicarbonate which is present and I told you right at the beginning of this chapter that bicarbonate is a freely filtered ion. In spite of being negatively charged, this is a freely filtered ion. So what will happen? This H plus combines with bicarbonate to form H2CO3 and which in turn splits into carbon dioxide and water. So that means there is no free H plus which is present to acidify the urine. The H plus has been buffered by the filtered bicarbonate. Filtered bicarbonate, right? H plus is going to be filtered by carbonate, is buffered by the filtered by carbonate. Okay. Now, an important point here is, so there is no change. There is no change in the pH of tubular fluid at 
end of PCT because the H plus which is secreted in the PCT is getting buffered by the bicarbonate. Now, the H plus which is generated in the cell, uh, sorry, the bicarbonate ion which is generated in the cell, this now moves into the plasma. This moves into the plasma, right? The H plus is secreted by secondary active countertransport. It, it is buffered by the bicarbonate. So no change in pH of the tubular fluid at the end of PCT. The bicarbonate which is generated in the cell, this bicarbonate moves from the cell into the plasma. There is carbonic anhydrase karthikyan associated with the brush border. Carbonic anhydrase is also present on the brush border. Now, the, now, in the PCT, if you can see this over here, in the PCT, for every H plus secreted, for every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. One bicarbonate is reabsorbed. How reabsorbed? One bicarbonate is disappearing from the lumen. One bicarbonate is entering into the blood. See, what is reabsorption? Reabsorption means to disappear from the lumen and appear in the blood. And that's exactly what's happening. One bicarbonate is disappearing from the lumen and entering into the blood. Right? But we call it, this is known as an indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate. This is an indirect, indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate. This is known as an, in, why indirect? Because you must understand there is, it is not the filtered bicarbonate which is entering into the blood. But yes, for every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate is entering into the blood, isn't it? So we can say there is a reabsorption, but this is an indirect reabsorption. This has been asked as a question. Site of indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate, this is going to be PCT. So if I say, if I say 4,200 millimoles of H plus is secreted in the PCT, how much of bicarbonate is reabsorbed in PCT? Answer this question. How much bicarbonate reabsorbed in PCT is reabsorbed in the PCT? Four thousand two hundred millimoles per day, equal to the H plus secretion, right? Equal to the H plus secretion. If H plus secretion is four thousand two hundred millimoles per day in the PCT, the bicarbonate reabsorption will also be the same. For every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate is reabsorbed, but this reabsorption is the indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate. Indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate. Right? So this is what is what happens in the PCT. Okay? Now, thereafter, now let us see. Um, let us see what happens in the collecting duct. Collecting duct, especially the eye cells. Let's see what is the mechanism of H plus secretion in the collecting duct and which collecting duct cells are going to be involved. That is the eye cells, right? Collecting duct will be the eye cells. Let us see what is the mechanism of, so of H plus secretion in the eye cells. Now, in the eye cells as well, in the eye cells as well, carbon dioxide plus water 
forms H2CO3. Now there is carbonic anhydrase present even in the eye cells, but the carbonic anhydrase is much less. These cells have carbonic anhydrase, but they are poor in carbonic anhydrase. Which are the cells which are rich in carbonic anhydrase? PCT. These cells are poor in carbonic anhydrase. Okay. This also splits into H plus and HCO3 minus. The H plus now leaves the cell via a primary active transport. So first major difference in the PCT cell, it was a secondary active counter transport. Secondary active counter transport. Here you have a primary active transport, which is also known as the H plus K plus ATPAs. H plus is secreted and K plus enters into the cell. This K plus can leak out again, right? So K plus is circulate, circulating at the luminal side. It enters into the cell, leaks out, then again enters into the cell via the H plus K plus ATPase. Now what happens to this H plus? See, what is a buffer? Buffer is anything which binds the H plus and does not change the pH. So the H plus which comes out over here. Now to bind this H plus, there is no bicarbonate which is left. Because what has happened to the bicarbonate? Bicarbonate, filtered bicarbonate, 80% is reabsorbed in the PCT. 20% remaining, 20% is in thick ascending limb and DCT. Mechanism same as in PCT. So 100% of bicarbonate is gone. 80% in the PCT, 20% thick ascending limb and DCT mechanism, same as the PCT. This is if bicarbonate levels are normal. If there is excessive bicarbonate in the blood, alkalosis, then bicarbonate will be lost in the urine. Right? Now, to buffer this H+, you have another, you have another buffer, which is called H+. PO4 2 minus monohydrogen phosphate. This gets converted into dihydrogen phosphate H2PO4 1 minus. This is known as the titratable tri titratable acidity. This is what is responsible for the acidification of the urine. Right? Let's see this once again. What happens in the collecting duct? In the collecting duct, also you have the presence of carbonic anhydrase. So carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, but you have to keep in mind that the collecting duct cells are poor in carbonic anhydrase. PCT cells are rich in carbonic anhydrase. Again, H2CO3 is formed, which splits into H plus and HCO3 minus. H plus is now secreted by primary active transport. Primary active transport. In the PCT, it was a secondary active counter transport. To buffer the H plus, there is no bicarbonate which is left because 80% of the bicarbonate was utilized in the PCT. For every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate entered into the blood. Yes, we said indirect reabsorption. PCT, 80% is gone. 20% thick ascending limb and PCT. Okay. Varun Jodh saying basics beta first chapter counter transport is only for secondary active. Not, it is not used for primary active. This is titratable acidity. Okay. Now, I've also told you Ammonia. We discussed ammonia and we said ammonia is also a urinary buffer. So let's see what happens as far as ammonia is concerned. Now, this is the same collecting duct cell. 
seen collecting duct cells? Now, again, the H plus K plus ATP is H plus K plus ATP is right? ammonia can be synthesized by these cells from glutamine. We have discussed this in the first chapter itself. And ammonia will diffuse out of the cells. H plus and ammonia will form ammonium ion. Ammonium ion, non ionic diffusion of ammonia. Ammonia diffuses in a non ionic form, but after diffusion, it ionizes. So, this is your non ionic diffusion. So, now my next important point is what are the urinary buffers? Which are the urinary buffers? Which are the urinary buffers? Number one is bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is your urinary buffer. This is the most important in the PCT. This is most important in the PCT is the bicarbonate. It is a urinary buffer. Number two, phosphate. This is the most important in the collected duct. Number three, ammonia. Ammonia is also a urinary buffer. Ammonia is also a urinary buffer. Please remember, ammonia is known as an inducible urinary buffer. This is known as a inducible urinary buffer. Why is it known as an inducible urinary buffer? It is known as an inducible urinary buffer because in acidosis, in acidosis, there is an increase in the ammonia production. In acidosis, there is an increase in ammonia production. So this is known as an inducible urinary buffer. Acidosis, there is no increase in bicarbonate or phosphate. Somebody was asking me, where does phosphate come from? Filtration. This is an ion which is filtered. Phosphates, th this is going to be filtered, right? So bicarbonate, phosphate and ammonia. These are the three urinary buffers. So three important questions here. Most important buffer in the PCT bicarbonate, most important buffer in the collecting duct, phosphate, which is an inducible urinary buffer, this is going to be ammonia. These are your three, three urinary buffers. Let's have a look at this. Again, in the collecting duct, what happens in the collecting duct? We said for every H, the H plus which is secreted will be first buffered by HPO4 one, two minus monohydrogen phosphate to form dihydrogen phosphate which is known as dihydrogen phosphate, which is known as your titratable acidity. Based on this also, you had a, based on this, you also had, you had a question which said, urinary acidification is due to, urine acidification is due to which acid? A, is it going to be hydrochloric acid? Is it going to be sulfuric acid? Is it going to be nitric acid? Or D, is it going to be phosphoric acid? Bolo. Which acid is responsible for acidification of the urine? Acidification of the urine is because of phosphoric acid. Thank God, it's not hydrochloric or sulfuric or nitric acid. Life would have been very difficult. This is phosphoric acid, which is responsible for, this is the one which is responsible for acidification, titratable acidity, right? This is, uh, this is as far as your, now one important point here, and that is for every H plus now bicarbonate, 
one bicarbonate for every H plus secreted in the collecting duct, one bicarbonate will enter into the blood. So in the collecting duct, for every H plus secreted, For every H plus secreted, one new bicarbonate is generated. One new bicarbonate is generated. Why did I say new bicarbonate? Because unlike in the PCT, PCT, it was related for every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate was reabsorbed, isn't it? It was related to the filtered bicarbonate. Here, there is no bicarbonate in the, in the tubular fluid. So this is a new bicarbonate which is being generated, right? So I call kidney a very smart organ. Why do I call it a smart organ is because all the filtered bicarbonate is reabsorbed and kidney can also generate a new bicarbonate. What is the site of generation of new bicarbonate? Collecting duct. What is the site of indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate? PCT. For every H plus secreted, right? Please see this. In the PCT, for every H plus secreted, one bicarbonate is reabsorbed, which is an indirect reabsorption of bicarbonate. In the collecting duct, for every H plus secreted, one new bicarbonate will be generated. Kidney is a smart organ reabsorbing all the filtered bicarbonate. And she also generates a new bicarbonate. And I hope you've understood why I've called kidney she, smart organ. This is your... <laughs> <laughs> Go from here, otherwise they'll both stop laughing. Let it be. All right. <laughs> okay. So this is this is as far as your acid secretion by the kidney is concerned, right? Uh, important questions we've already done, and that is um, site of maximum H plus secretion PCT acidification collecting duct urinary buffers three bicarbonate, phosphate, ammonia, most important urinary buffer in the PCT, bicarbonate in the collecting duct, phosphate, which is an inducible, indu inducible urinary buffer, ammonia, right? One important question, and then we can take a break, and that is, what is the limiting pH of the kidney? What is the limiting pH of the kidney? Limiting pH of the kidney. Is pH of 4.5. The mass maximum acidification which can be achieved by the kidney is a pH of 4.5. This is the maximum acidification which can be done. <laughs> yes, somebody's written brain is he and kidney is she. All right. Okay, now take a break. Enough, let me, let me continue laughing, right? So break for 10 minutes, break till 4.15. Okay, see you.